after lunch. And so I'm going to be honest with you, it was a little bit selfish, but I flopped it around and I said, let's have preaching and preaching and lunch and then Sunday school. And really, it's a lot easier on the young kids, especially because the Sunday school is kind of interactive, and then the older folks have to push through in Sunday school. And I guess you could say today, I feel most sorry for the adult Sunday school teacher. They'll be <laughs> teaching Sunday school while the uh, student body has a full stomach, and that can be an arduous task, to say the least, all right? Romans chapter number six this morning. It couldn't have been better that this message would fall on a piggyback day because I really would like to finish Romans chapter 6. We've been preaching in this chapter now for a couple of weeks, and uh, this day will give us a chance for me to preach back-to-back -back messages, hopefully finishing the chapter. And uh, I've got kind of, I guess you could say, uh, an intent on how uh, I want to do that, and I'll share my plans with you momentarily. In verse 15 of Romans chapter 6, of course, we've been preaching through the chapter. Paul's talking about the subject of sanctification in the life of the believer. And he says this in verse number 15, after all he's said up to this point, he says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are ye to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, you become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Really for, I'm going to be preaching this one message. I'll be breaking it up into two services. So I'll preach the first part this morning in this service. The second part I'll preach in the 11 o'clock hour. But feast your eyes for this verse message back on verse number 18. The Apostle Paul said, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. If you'll know, if you'll remember through the chapter, Paul has been talking about the life that we had before salvation, then he, he compares it to the life we have now in salvation, and he says that because when we were saved, we were baptized with Christ earlier in the chapter, he says we are now servants, or we have become servants to righteousness. That word servant there literally means to become a slave. So before we were saved, we were slaves to sin, and he says, now you have become a, a bond slave to righteousness. And he said that in relation to what he starts off in verse 15, uh, kind of proposing a question. He says, what then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. He says, God forbid. You and I will talk momentarily about the reason he's talking about that again. And can I say this morning that one of the beautiful things about salvation is that it released us from the condemning power of the law. That's what Paul's saying there in verse 15. He says, he said, we're not under the law anymore. We've been made free from it by, by what Christ did for us on the cross. He said, but in lieu of that or in light of it, he said, because we're not under the law and under grace, are we now free to commit sin? I'll be honest with you this morning. You and I want to understand this about what salvation done for us. It didn't release us to sin. It released us from sin. And there's a lot of confusion in the day we're living in. And the word grace and the, and the conversations about the grace of God are being adulterated, in my opinion, whenever you compare them to what the Scriptures actually teach about the subject. Now, I didn't plan this today, but because of what Paul is saying here, that means this, I'm not free to live wrong, I'm free to live right. And that's the title of the message today, simply this. I know it's 4th of July, I know it's Independence Day, but this ain't about being an American freedom, all right? This is about freedom from sin. The title is this, Free to live right. 
That's what Paul's communicating here to us. And that's, an, that's, a, that's an area or an understanding uh, about sanctification. Every child of God needs to grab hold of today. When Jesus saved you and I, he released us from the power of the law. Has no power anymore to condemn us, all right? No power. We've been saved by grace. We're now under grace. And that grace has released us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. And we are free to live right. If you choose to live wrong, if you choose to live in sin, you're putting yourself back in the very bondage that Jesus died to release you from. So for a few minutes this morning, free to live right. Brother Gary Sewell, if you would please pray for us this morning. Amen and amen. We thank the Lord this morning for the reading of his word. Chapter 6 of the book of Romans, in my opinion, has been one of the probably most important chapters I have preached to the church since I've been the pastor here for the last 16 years. The reason being is after you get saved, understanding what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 6, 7 and 8 is vitally important to understanding what's going on in your Christian life and also comprehending what your responsibilities are and how that there is an abundant life that Jesus spoke of in the Gospels that he came to gave us. It is available to us. That was not a utopia or pipe dream, but God literally wants you and I to live inside of that. What he is teaching us in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 I believe is very vital to making that, uh, I guess you could say, a reality. Now, my desire today is simply this. I would love to preach about two thirty to 35 minute messages on this subject because the content is uh, is meaty and it's something that I, I don't want to try to give it all to you at one time, force feed it, leave it to you, leave it on your hair or on your lap and you choking to death on it. I want to kind of walk through this text, uh, I guess you could say methodically enough to where it'll click and you get it because I believe it's very important. Now when I say I'm going to plan to preach 30 to 35 minutes, it'd be a good time to have an altar call right now and God's people pray that I would be able to achieve that goal, right? It's very hard for sometimes for me to do that. But in retrospect, if I'm going to make it, I can't goof off much this morning, right? In chapter 6 of the book of Romans, Paul's been explaining the doctrine of sanctification. The reason he's doing that, I'm just reviewing quickly with you to bring us back up to speed, is because the Jewish believers there are very worried that these Gentiles getting saved by quote-unquote grace... Uh, how they might would live in relation to the law. They were concerned there that, that they may, may become lawless rebels since there was nothing to keep them in check. There was no law to make them do right. They were afraid there would be no restraint in their lives because they weren't under the law anymore. Paul assures them, though, in this chapter that they have nothing to fear for anybody that experiences salvation by grace will also experience that spirit baptism we preached about earlier in the chapter in which they would die to sin with Christ and experience a spiritual resurrection from being dead in trespass and in sin. It would totally, it would totally change the relation the believer has to sin. Therefore, it is an explanation of how sanctification works in the life of the believer. That brings us up to speed of where we're at now in the text. Let's look in verse 15 and hop in this morning with the help of the Lord and try to make some segue or leeway if we can. In verse 15, Paul says, all right, he's answering, he's raising the same question in a different manner that he's asked a few times in the chapter, pointing back to the earlier concerns about what would happen under grace if there's no law to keep us in check. He says, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And then he gives that emphatic, God forbid, I think this is at least the second, maybe the third time in this chapter that he has said that. He is driving home the point and making it very clear. You know, Jesus spoke very clearly whenever he was on this earth in his ministry about what Paul is discussing here. If you want to write a reference down, you can write down the book of John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36. Here's what Jesus said on this subject. In John 8, 34, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. And he says in verse 36, If the son therefore make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Free from what's the question was Jesus talking about? Free from being a servant to sin. 
That's the reason Jesus had to go to the cross. Man could not free himself from sin by obeying or keeping the law. He needed a relationship with God. He needed an indwelling helper like the Holy Spirit that would remind him, convince him, convict him, and challenge him on the issue of sin. And Jesus went to the cross to die so that you and I, when we get saved by God's good grace, could have that relationship with him. And so that's the relationship that Christ gave us, and that relationship would change the New Testament Christian's relationship with sin after being saved by grace. Look in verse 16. We'll start to unpackage this the best that we can. He says, no, you're not. In other words, he said, I've asked a question in verse 15. Now I'm going to answer the question that I just asked. No, you're not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin and the death or of obedience unto righteousness. Interestingly enough here, Paul is using the pronouns of whom and his in this verse, and it points to the idea that Paul is talking about a particular person, a particular place, or a particular thing. There's no person in the verse, there's not a place in the verse, but there are two things in the verse that Paul is pointing toward, and it is these things that are polar opposite. It is sin on one hand, and it is righteousness on the other. And with what Paul is saying in that verse, it is this, that whatever you yield to, you serve. If you yield your life to sin, you'll become a servant of sin. But if you yield yourself to righteousness, you will become a servant of righteousness. Notice there in verse 16, he says very clearly, To whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. It is a day-by-day, situation-by-situation decision that the believer makes on yielding. That word yield simply means to participate. If you're a note-taker, you can write that down this morning. And can I say that because of that, what Paul is trying to, I guess you could say, get us to understand is this, whatever we participate in, we will produce fruit from. Whatever you choose or allow yourself to yield to, eventually you'll be serving it. Whatever you serve will eventually dominate your life. Understanding this will help the Christian own some of the responsibility that sanctification brings to their life. Let me give you an example of that this morning. If we are tempted to sin, a decision is made. I'm either going to yield to that temptation or I'm not. And every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, right? That's what we talked about in messages previous. If I yield, then I'll become a servant to sin. However, listen to me now, in the same manner when tempted to sin, if instead of yielding to the temptation, I choose rather to yield to righteousness, I now serve righteousness instead of serving sin. But every day you and I are making decisions on yielding, and whatever I am yielding to, I am then serving. The choice of yielding is important. Here's why, because it dictates what path you take. Let me give you an example of uh, what yielding looks like in another scripture that will bring it to light in what we're talking about. Do you remember over in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 11, uh, we, uh, the writer there is talking about the subject of chastisement or chastening and he makes this statement about it. He says, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. In other words, when God is discipling you, educating you, uh, training you, he said it can be a grievous process. Why is that? Because man is naturally proud and for God to chasten him means he's got to continually show him the areas in his life that he's wrong and expect from him repentance and turning from his ways. That's why the process can be very arduous. He says, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. In that verse, here's what yielding looks like. Whenever you comply with chastening, it brings about the fruit of righteousness in your life. And can I say this morning that our lives end up being a culmination of what we are yielding to. For the believer this morning, we are as close to God as the decisions we've made to get there. And we are as far away from God in fellowship as the decisions we have made to get there. You made decisions last week, so did I, whether I was going to yield to temptation or whether I was going to yield to and serve righteousness. I'll make decisions today, I'll make them tomorrow, I'll make them every day for the rest of my life. There's never going to be a day where you just get like, as some denominations teach, that you get sanctified and the battle's over. I wish they was right. I'd sign up for it today. I'd be like, yeah, baptize me three times upside down in the Jordan if that's what it takes. I mean, I'd love for the... That's why heaven looks so sweet now. 
Heaven looks so sweet this morning because it'll be the final resting place. I told you that salvation saved us from the penalty of sin. We are being saved right now from the power of sin. But whenever we die and go to be with Jesus, we're finally saved from the presence of sin. I mean, hey, hallelujah, you talk about something to be excited about this morning. I'm glad there's coming a day where there's a place we're going to end up residing where there is no sin. The temptation's not there. Listen now, we're in the glorified body God always intended for us to have. And the battle with that stuff's over. I'm at the age now where people in my age group, I got to, you know, look back into my late teens, early 20s now, and you get to start looking at decisions and paths people chose, and there are people whose lives are wrecked and ruined because of decisions they made 20 years ago, and there's some people whose lives are more stable, and especially those who got saved by God's grace are doing, doing well, and it's all about what you choose to yield to because it puts you on a course or path with your future. Now, in verse 17, watch what he goes on to say. He says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now, I want to start off by saying well, there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to try to unpack it by piecemeal if I can. But understand this in verse 17. Here, Paul is not excusing a yielding to sin. When Paul says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine, he's rather clarifying why it wouldn't be happening. When he said were, he's talking about past tense. Okay? Now, hang on a minute. Before we go any deeper into that thought, understand this. While we're talking about making decisions, lest you and I start making credit for the decisions we've made or for the path that we've taken and get somewhat of a big head on us, don't forget that had God not interjected himself into our lives, there would have been no decision to make. That's why Paul said, but God be thanked. Paul didn't say, I'm glad y'all done good. I'm glad y'all turned from wrong and started doing right. He said, oh no, had God not showed up in your life, there wouldn't be a new path for you to walk on. You wouldn't be living this new way. You wouldn't have the power to break from the bonds of sin at all. We'd have kept right on being slaves to sin had the grace of God not showed up in our lives, all right? So salvation is why we change courses. When you look at Matthew 7 and, and verses 13 and 14, whenever they're talking about the straight gate that leads to the narrow way or the broad gate, that leads to destruction. It was mining your interaction with the grace of God and, and listen, and trusting Him in salvation that changed our course. I was born on the broad road. Yes, everybody's born on the broad way that leads to destruction. But I thank God I heard the gospel. Hearing the gospel gave me an opportunity to change courses. And if you, I want to say this, if you entered at the straight gate and are on the narrow way, the grace of God is what got you there. Now, while the grace of God saves us, it doesn't make all the decisions for us. No, no differently than God did not, I guess you could say, predetermine your salvation. He didn't predetermine the choices you'll make. You're not a robot, nor being controlled by a puppet master. You are living a life right now, freedom of choice. And in verse number 17, watch what he says. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. That should be our past tense state. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Now, when the Bible talks about doctrine, it's simply talking about sound Bible teaching. He says when that doctrine was delivered, you obeyed it. In other words, you made a decision. And can I say this? Everybody makes a decision with that form of doctrine, either to obey it or to disobey it. Now, I want to make sure you understand what form of doctrine he's talking about. He's talking about the gospel. In other words, whenever you were lost in your sins, you were confronted with your condition. The Word of God says all of sin and come short of God's glory. When you heard that gospel message and realized you were hopeless in your sins, condemned by the law, and bound for hell, you had to obey the gospel to get saved. What do you mean obey the gospel, preacher? What works do I do? No, the obeying is whenever you transfer your trust. You transfer your trust from anything else that you're believing will get you to heaven and you put it on Jesus. The moment you do that, you become saved by God's amazing grace. You become born again into the family of God. You obey that form of doctrine. And obeying the gospel brings biblical salvation. It's the only thing that will bring biblical salvation. Why don't you listen to this closely? Obeying the gospel, which brings to you biblical salvation, also gives us a desire to obey the other doctrines of the Bible. 
For an unsaved person, they have no ability to obey. They have no ability to obey. To even think about complying with Scripture in any form or fashion is a very taxing and overwhelming expectation for them. But to a genuine believer who possesses the Holy Spirit of God, it's not that way at all. As a matter of fact, I'll give you a reference Scripture that makes what Paul's talking about now make the most sense. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 1-3, through 3, the Bible says this, Whosoever believeth. In other words, this applies to everybody that believes. Understand that? This applies to everybody that believes. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Can I say that someone who gets genuinely born again, just like they obeyed the gospel, that form of doctrine from the heart, they will then also start having a desire to know, understand, and obey the other doctrines from the Word of God. From the heart, it's not grievous to walk in scriptural truth. It would be if you were unconverted. It would be a yoke of bondage hung around your neck. It would make your life overbearing. You would feel like the more I try, the worse I see myself. But see, when you get saved by grace and you positionally change places, you realize that you're in Christ and He's in you. You're not condemnable by the law anymore. Therefore, you're not serving the Word or the Lord out of duty. You're doing it out of delight. He's your master. You love him. You're in relationship. You're not earning anything. Everything you could ever want be in salvation has already been given to you. You're in a blessed state, and that's why you do the things that you do. To a genuinely saved person who's been spirit baptized, it ain't grievous at all. Matter of fact, it's a dead giveaway that salvation is missing when people get offended by the expectations the Word of God puts on them after they get saved. Dead giveaway. The kind of dead giveaway that ought to change mine in your prayer life. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples of that, okay? First of all, the, the parable of the sower. When Jesus was talking about the parable of the sower and explaining it in Matthew chapter number 13, can we turn the fans on, please? It's running down my back. In Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21, here's what Jesus said in his explanation of the parable of the sower. He said, but he that received the seed into the stony place. In other words, one of the seeds fell on stony ground. He said, the one that received it in the stony place, the same as he that heareth the word and Annan with joy receiveth it. I mean, if you, if you saw him, you'd think, man, oh boy, he got in. But in the next verse, verse 21, he says this, yet hath no root in himself. Now, there is some debate on whether these ones like this really just, you know, are saved or not. But hang on. See, soil four has root, bears fruit. Soil four has root, bears fruit. Soil three, no root, no fruit. You tell me. Anyway, here's what he says. Yet he hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while. It means he makes it for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he's offended. In other words, he does good. He made a profession of faith, made it to the baptismal pool, thought the old boy got in. But then when he started getting around the things of God, started hearing sound Bible preaching, stuff like that right there, next thing you know, it wasn't too long at all. And he was like, ah, too much for me. I'm out. I'm glad I'm saved. And I'm going to heaven when I die, but I'm out. I'm just telling y'all we're living in the South and it's not uncommon for folks to make the Bible school childhood profession at eight or nine and by the time they become a teenager, they're gone. They live the next 30, 40 years of life drunk, servants and slaves to sin. And if you go try to talk to them about their salvation, they'll guarantee you because of that they're all right. I'm telling you, according to what Paul says here in Romans 6, that's a bad, bad deal. Amen, according to the parable of the sword, it's a bad deal. When you've got a problem with the Word of God, you've got a problem with doctrine, when it offends you, means, in other words, I was doing good, I heard that, not, not for me. Perse you know, when he's talking about persecution arising because of the word, here's what happened. When God saves us, starts showing us how he wants us to live, we start conforming to that. Then family and friends start giving us junk over it. We back off because I'd rather have them than him anyhow. He said there's a problem with that. Ain't a root there. If there's any root there, that wouldn't be the decision they want to make. Amen? The pastoral epistles warned us about this as well. Here's what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. He says this to, to the young pastor in training. He said, preach the word. 
Be instant in season, out of season, to prove, rebuke, exhort with all own suffering and doctrine. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn their ears away from the truth to be turned into fables. That's what Paul said would happen in the last days. And can I say this right here? When a genuine believer is described as somebody who obeys doctrine from the heart, how can someone be saved when they turn from sound doctrine and turn to fables? You do realize one of the leading ways people look for a place to settle down these days and attend on a regular basis is what do they preach? Which I think should be the number one question. Doctrine should be king. But they don't ask that hoping that it's line upon line, precept upon precept, sound Bible doctrine. They want to know what things do they preach there that may cause me to have to change my life. Because I'm real comfortable in this death pool I'm in right now. And if I find out these two or three things there that I just ain't jihad with, I'm, I, I believe I, I ain't, that ain't for me. And there's something wrong when people are turned off by sound doctrine and the expectations from God's Word that comes with it. That's why I made my mind up a long time ago. I'm going to preach the Word. Amen. I'm going to preach the Word by the good grace of God, the whole counsel of God. I, I'm not going to dodge what's unpopular because I'm not going to intentionally kill our church by filling the pews with tares. Does that make sense? I, I love to hear Sister Patsy Woodell's testimony without probably even understanding sometimes or knowing what she says. So many times when she's testified in the past about her salvation, she said, it was the doctrine you preached that God used to open my eyes. You better believe that's right. It's doctrine. Doctrine has always got the job done and doctrine will continue. Listen, for some reason or another, I don't know when it happened, what decade, what generation it happened with, but for some reason or another, church became more about being entertained than about being grounded. I remember when I, in my younger days, I, I remember hearing things like this regularly, and I don't know what y'all going to think about what I'm getting ready to say, but it'll be okay. I, I remember people would come after I got done preaching, and they say stuff like that. Man, I tell you what, well, I enjoy that preaching. That fireball preaching. Oh, boy, I like it right there loud. And, you know, this, that, and the other. And um, I look back now and think, yeah, but I didn't hardly say nothing. It was a tornado with no rain. <laughs> and I'm not, I mean, there are some guys who, 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 do, who can just, they preach the paint off the walls like that and, and full of meat and content and everything else. But here's where God started getting to me. Well, hang on a second now. If the call to preach is a call to help people understand and apply within the thing that really means more to me than anything is not whether you remember maybe a cliche I say or whether or not you know I sweat when I preach or whether or not you can, you know, whether I hack or not and whether y'all, but when you walk out of here on Sunday, do you know what the Word of God said? And is it changing and challenging your life? That's what it's about, right? I mean, the Lord calls us preachers to feed His people with knowledge and understanding is what He desires from them. And it's not about entertainment, all right? And I'm to the place now where I'm just a little too invested to consider backing off. I mean, if I, I'm, I'm thankful that pastoring here, there's never been any pressure to back off. The expectation's always been that I would hold the line. I would say the majority of you are here now because of that very thing, because we've tried to hold the line doctrinally. And you know I, I love your family. I love your friends. I, I, I'm concerned for and praying with you over the people you're trying to reach for Christ with the gospel and, uh, but, but whether or not I'll back off to make them comfortable to come is not, it's not negotiable. I mean, you'd be better off praying that I would die because I hope that would happen before I would ever stop preaching the word to entertain people and to keep them comfortable while they're in a bad spot. But here's what I have found out over the years. Genuinely safe people seek sound doctrine. They don't run away from it, they run to it. This here is sheep food. Sheep eat this stuff. I mean, they, 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 I've seen them before starving to death for it and get a nibble of it and you can't run them off. That's the truth. And uh, it happens from time to time. You hope it isn't happening to many people that you know, but it does happen from time to time. They're, they're, a, a, a saved person is as attracted to sound doctrine as a fish is to water. It does something for their soul. So back in Romans chapter 6, verse 18, watch what he says. He says, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, 
and paid the sin penalty for humanity, buried in the borrowed tomb, raised the third day, when you became one with Him, you were made free from sin. What followed that is you becoming a servant to righteousness. Here is the million dollar question for everybody. When did that happen in your life? When did we become servants of righteousness? By making decisions to yield to righteousness and not yield to sin. Because can I say this morning that a profession of faith that didn't change what you serve is empty and worthless. That's what Paul's saying. He said, look, you Jewish guys are worried to death because these, these Gentiles now know they're not under the law. You're afraid they're going to run with reckless abandon and they're going to they're gonna embarrass God by being lawless uh, rebels. They're going to break the law and they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna live in debauchery. He said, you're all worried about that. What you don't understand is because of spirit baptism at the moment of conversion, God gives you this whole new relationship with sin and to where you once were a slave to it, you now become a servant to righteousness. Now, as I said last week, sometimes some people are late bloomers in that area just because they're not around a lot of sound doctrine once they get saved. It wouldn't bother me at all to be a late bloomer. It would bother me if I didn't bloom at all. You hear me? It wouldn't bother me to be a late bloomer. It would bother me not to bloom at all. And so Paul says, understand that being made free from sin you are or have become a servant of righteousness. Now, I want to add one thing here this morning, and I'm going to try to wrap up here momentarily and leave you to chew on this for about 20, 30 minutes, and we'll pick back up and finish the last part of the chapter. But for the child of God, let me add something this morning, because this is something we don't appreciate or comprehend much at all. There is no sin, and I mean absolutely positively no sin that you can get victory over. Why is that? Because Jesus came to die and pay the penalty for all sin. So, Brother Jonathan, this morning, if let's just say this morning that my sin problem was anger. I can get victory over that sin problem because Jesus died for it. I am spiritually unified with him at my salvation, which means I died with him and I died to sin. The only way sin will have power over me is if I make a conscious decision to yield to it. What if my sin problem is unforgiveness? Listen to me. I can have victory over it if I want it. Every time old thoughts start to rise, every time the accuser starts to bring up how I had been hurt and sinned again, and all that may be very true. I can make a conscientious decision to forgive yes, like I've been forgiven, Amen. and I don't have to serve the hard taskmaster of unforgiveness. But I can move on with joy in my Christian life. What if I have a problem with a wondering eye? I don't have to be a slave to that. In Lamentations, Jeremiah said that he made a covenant with his eyes that he wouldn't look on a maid, right? So in other words, if one man was successful and had the pattern to get victory in that area, that pattern reigns supreme for all of us. I don't have to serve the lustful, wondering eye that could be so easily engaged in the culture we're living in. Am I telling the truth right now or am I not, Right? America's about one step away from being a third world country whenever it gets over 70 degrees. It's good preaching this morning, Brother Mike. Yeah, yeah, it's real good preaching. You run the well now. Thought I'd help myself a little bit on, on camera. <laughs> right, you're running well. I know, I know. But in the same, I don't have to be a slave to any sin. What I battle when it comes to the lustful seeds in my heart, what I battle that keeps me from yielding to righteousness is this simple, silly idea. 
of what I may miss out on if I just give it to God and get right. In other words, if it's anger and I don't just give that over to God and get it in, under control, well, then I may lose my edge. If it's unforgiveness, the adversary tells me, yeah, but if you forgive them, then who's going to hold them accountable? God is. <laughs> it's not my responsibility or my place anyway, Amen. right? Matter of fact, God even said, if I don't, he said, then I'm going to withhold some forgiveness from you, according to the parable in Matthew 18, and let you live in the prison of unforgiveness, which is where a lot of people live their lives these days. There's not one sin. And can I say this morning, and I'll get into it deeper in the 11 o'clock message, you're going to find this out, that once you yield yourself one way or the other, it builds a momentum. It's like a snowball rolling downhill. If I yield myself to righteousness, I start building up my Christian faith, and I get stronger and stronger and stronger. But if I yield to sin, it also starts building a momentum. And they start stacking up like cordwood. And if you're ever wondering how somebody's so sound and solid in the faith with a great resume doing so well for so long can all of a sudden fall off the wagon, the answer is it didn't start all of a sudden. It didn't happen overnight. It was a yielding here and a yielding there and a yielding here. And a lot of the yieldings go on in here where nobody out here can see them, we just see great is the fall of it when it comes to a culmination. So here's where you and I are lightly reproved this morning. We are lightly reproved from this standpoint, okay? That I need to probably check up on what I'm yielding to now because if I'm yielding participating it, leaning the wrong way. If I keep leaning that way, I'll build momentum and steam. I'll get to the place where there's, it's going to be a lot harder to come back to the center of the aisle and start leaning the right way. And so this morning, you and I should be able to get victory over the temptations, victory over the sins, because Christ died from it. We're free from it. If we'll stop yielding to it, we can experience the freedom that God's give us in His Son. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. I'm going to stop right there for the sake of just digesting what we've said. The pianist is going to come this morning.